Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome all. My name is Vicki Bowden for those um, that are joining for the first time. I am a project manager here in the Human Oncology Pathogenesis Program. Again, we'd like to welcome you all to our Summer Student Program Summer Research Seminar Series. Um, and today we have Dr. Williams, who will be um, our seminar speaker before I introduce him. I'd like to remind you all about a couple of points if you're joining for the first time. The first is our Q&A feature. So here on Zoom, there's a Q&A feature where you could submit your questions and Dr. Williams and I will address them later on um, in our session. And if we don't cover them, as a reminder, we do have a Twitter option where um, we'll be sending you an email um, after our seminar series with um, how to submit your questions for Dr. Williams to respond via Twitter. Um, secondly, attendee surveys. You'll also be getting a reminder email to complete your surveys after each seminar session. And lastly, our recordings. Um, we are posting our recordings within 48 hours. So if this is your first seminar and you'd like to view the others, please visit our YouTube page as well, HOP Summer Student Program. And we'll also send that information on in the email that we'll send everyone shortly. And so again, we welcome you all to our seminar today for cancer as a genetic and evolutionary disease. Our speaker for this afternoon is Dr. Mark Williams. Mark completed his undergraduate degree in physics from the University of Manchester in 2012. During his studies, he became very interested in applying quantitative methods to biological problems. This led him to pursue graduate school at University College of London's quantitative biology program. He completed his PhD under the supervision of Professor Trevor Graham in 2018, where he developed new approaches to study cancer evolution. In October of 2019, he joined Dr. Sarab Shah's lab here at MSK in order to further pursue his cancer evolution research using novel single cell approaches. And again, welcome Dr. William. Uh, thanks, Vicky. I'll just share my screen. Um, okay, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, and thanks to everyone for taking some time out there today and to join me to hear me talk a bit about some of my research and some of the wider research into cancer and how it can be viewed as a genetic and evolutionary disease. Um, so my talk is kind of structured into three parts. So I'm going to just talk a bit about myself and where I've come from. Um, and then I'm going to dive into um, talking about cancer as a genetic disease and how, it, and then how it can also be viewed as an evolutionary disease. Um, so this is kind of recapping a bit what Vicky already said, but I'm coming from maybe a kind of unusual background for someone who's studying um, cancer biology. So I studied physics for my undergraduate degree. And, and I always was always quite interested in, um, you know, using equations to describe like physical phenomena and um, how mathematical modeling could be used in research. And during my studies, I kind of, uh, I spent a research project um, in a, an institute that um, studies cancer, in particular looking at um, how radioisotopes could be used to um, look at cancer and diagnose people with cancer. And that led me to kind of realizing that I could use those skills to study biology. Um, so that then led me to my graduate school program where I began uh, studying quantitative biology. Uh, and this led me to pursuing a PhD at the Barts Cancer Institute, um, which I completed in 2018. Um, and then uh, late last year, I came to MSKCC and I'm continuing that research um, in Professor Saurabh Shah's lab where uh, our lab uses lots of novel single cell technologies to look at um, questions related to cancer genetics and evolution. 
Uh, okay, so the, the first half of this talk, I'm going to talk about how cancer is uh, viewed as a genetic disease. Um, so here, I'm just going to kind of recap some information that perhaps you already know about the human genome. So the, the human genome is made up of um, a few billion base pairs, which consist of 23 chromosomes, 22 uh, chromosomes plus the sex chromosomes. And this uh, genome is made up of a genetic code of nucleic acids. So these might be familiar to you as A, T, C, and G. And what this genetic code is, is, is basically like a blueprint of the body's biological function. So everything that the body does is kind of encoded in these series of, uh, of letters. And as we'll kind of begin to see in this talk that cancer is kind of when this blueprint goes awry and um, parts of that code are, are disrupted, which means, which has consequences for the, the function of, of how the body um, functions. Uh, so we've got about 20,000 genes in um, our genome, which code for, for proteins. And this is the kind of the ultimate um, uh, piece of biological information. And all of these pro uh, proteins can kind of interact with each other and, and perform different functions. Um, so before diving into that a bit more, it's important to recognize there's a few different types of mutations that we might uh, be concerned about. So these two different types can be grouped into somatic and germline. So when uh, scientists talk about germline mutations, what they're talking about are mutations that can be passed on from parents to offspring. Um, and so these are germline mutations are mutations that mean you have blue eyes or brown eyes or, or you know, blonde hair, etc. But there's also some mutations that can be detrimental to, to how your body functions. So, and uh, germline mutations in cancer causing genes contribute perhaps to about 10% of cancers that we observe in uh, general populations. So for example, um, you may have heard of a gene called BRCA, B-R-C-A. So women who have a uh, particular variant of uh, the BRCA gene are more susceptible to getting breast cancer. And there are other examples in, in different tissues uh, of these kind of um, genes. Now, the other type of mutation, and what I'll concentrate for on for most of the talk, are somatic mutations. So these are mutations that are acquired in our cells throughout our life, and they're not passed on to, to our offspring. And many somatic mutations that we, we tend to see can be major drivers of cancer. So these are the in, can be important um, transitions going from normal uh, cellular function to malignant cellular function. And so I'm going to run through now a few of the different types of mutations that we can observe in cancer, and they go from very small scale changes on the, the left of this slide here up to very large scale changes of the genome. So at the, at the smaller end, we have these single base pair changes. So these are the kind of simplest type of mutations that we see in, in cancer genomes. So for example, when a, a T goes to a C, it would be one example of that kind of mutation. On a slightly larger genome scale, we observe what are called insertions or de and deletions. So these kind of diagrams here depict what that means. So on, on the left-hand side, you have this orange part of this chromosome is being duplicated. And that, uh, so it's being inserted into, in, into here so that this chromosome is now larger than it used to be. And we also can have the reverse where bits of the genome are deleted. So here, this, this yellow bit is, is being deleted in the, in the chromosome. Um, what we can also observe are whole chromosome losses or amplifications. So we might observe certain chromosomes being doubled and other times whole chromosomes being lost. While at the uh, extreme end of this scale, some cancers uh, undergo what's called whole genome doubling. So they double their, 
the, the entire genome and have uh, twice the amount of, of DNA in their cells. Um, one thing that kind of falls in between and can go from kind of small to large is that we have these unusual chromosome rearrangements sometimes. So here we've got these two chromosomes, one large one and one small one. And what's happening here is that they're swapping genetic material. Um, so this sometimes may uh, result in uh, uh, the same amount of DNA, but the genome itself is, has been rearranged. Okay, so uh, what does this kind of ultimately result in? So this is a, a picture of how abnormal um, uh, a cancer genome can become sometimes. So on the left-hand side is uh, a, a normal karyotype. So the, these pictures here are uh, called karyograms, and they um, show the composition of the different chromosomes in a, in a cell line or in a, in a human tissue. So on the left, we've got this normal male karyotype. So we've got two copies of each chromosome as we're a diploid organism. Whereas on the right hand side, we've got a karyotype from a cancer cell line uh, that's known as the HeLa cell line. And what you can see here is that some chromosomes have more DNA content than we would have expected. So we have three copies of chromosome one and four copies of chromosome 15, for example. Whereas chromosomes two and three have lost a copy. And uh, chromosome 13 here has is entirely missing. Um, so this would be very unusual in a human tumor, but it, it can sometimes happen. Um, so this HeLa cell line is in fact one of the, the cell lines that's used most often in laboratory research. Uh, so this, this cell line exists in various forms in thousands of research laboratories across the world, I would imagine. So what do these mutations do? How do we go from like a normally functioning cell to an abnormal malignant one? Uh, so what some, but not all, mutations do is they alter uh, cellular function. And it's kind of uh, instructive to think about these in terms of the, the so-called hallmarks of cancer. So, um, in this scientific review paper from Hannah Hunn and Weinberg in 2011, they characterize a number of hallmarks of cancer in terms of what the cells do that make them different from their, their normal counterparts. So uh, here they're depicted here. So they're the sustaining prolif proliferative signal, signaling, so uncon unconstrained growth, um, evading growth suppressors, uh, activating invasion and metastasis, enabling replicative immortality, inducing angiogenesis and resisting cell death. So what some of these uh, mutations in, uh, in cancer genomes do is activate some of these hallmark processes. Um, so how was this first discovered? So for a long time, it was thought that cancers were caused by viruses and not by genetic changes. And the first real evidence that this was caused by genetic changes was the so-called um, observation of the Philadelphia chromosome. So this was the first observation of an oncogene, and we'll get onto what oncogenes are in a, in a few slides time. But these two scientists, Peter Noel and David Tungerford, what they did was uh, looked at uh, chronic myeloid leukemia cells. And what they saw was that they observed very small uh, chromosome 22 in these patients with leukemia um, and wondered what, what that was. And what that turned out to be was uh, translocation. So one of these rearrangements that I mentioned earlier between chromosome nine and 22. And what this does is produce a fusion gene called BCR able uh, that causes cells to divide uncontrollably. So you can see that in this case here, this is one of these hallmarks of cancer. And um, this translocation produces an oncogene that, that um, causes the cells to, to divide uncontrollably. So you can see here on this diagram that 
pieces of the chromosome 9 are swapped with pieces on chromosome 22. So what are the different types of, of cancer genes? So I'm going to go through some different um, nomenclature and what, what uh, genes we might care about. So how do we define a driver gene? So these are genes which are clonally selected. So they have gives cells some advantage in the, in the body's ecosystem to divide and, and grow more than they should. So the first type of driver gene is an oncogene. So typically it's normal gene function is unrelated to cancer growth, but when it's mutated, it can cause uh, increased growth or survival. Uh, now the second class is so-called tumor suppressor genes. So the normal function of these is to suppress um, any abnormal growth or survival. So if a cell senses that it's um, going to grow uncontrollably, then these tumor suppressor genes can, can kick in and, and stop that from happening. And typically um, with these genes, both alleles must be mutated. So we, we need to knock out the, the function on uh, both copies that our cells have. Uh, another type of cancer gene is a mutator gene. So the normal function of these genes is to repair DNA mutations or suppress DNA damage. Um, so what happens when uh, these type of genes uh, dysfunctional is that uh, our genomes gain many more mutations. So you can see here on the right hand side, this these particular genomes have many mutations. And so this can increase the chances then of us uh, of a cell gaining an oncogene or a tumor suppressor gene mutation. And the other types of mutations that or genes that we're perhaps not so concerned about are housekeeper genes. So genes which are deleterious um, to cellular function if they're mutated, and passenger genes. So these are genes which have no overall effect. So in fact, most of the mutations that we observe in cancer genomes are of this passenger mutation uh, type. So lots of the, the work that's happened in the cancer genomics field is trying to distinguish driver genes from passenger genes. So how do we do that? Um, so the basic idea is to sequence the DNA of tumors and look for differences. Now, I know you're having another lecture shortly about sequencing, so I won't go into that in too much detail. But all I'll say is here's an Illumina sequencing machine. So this is the, the most prominent technology to do this. And this is an example of some uh, DNA that's been mapped to the human genome. So these letters across the bottom of this picture, uh, the reference human genome bases. And these gray uh, bars are chunks of DNA from the tumor. And you can see here in the middle of this picture, there's a number of these D DNA segments that have a G when typically they should have a C. Um, so this is an example of the, the ways that we look for, for mutations in tumors. And so hundreds of thousands of tumors have been sequenced in this way. And at, just at MSKCC, more than 50,000 uh, patients have had their tumors sequenced. So almost all patients that come to MSKCC um, undergo some form of genome sequencing these days. So uh, the hospital has a huge amount of data and um, it can help with uh, choosing treatment strategies or which um, kind of therapies patients may respond to. And what this data also allows researchers to do is to look for common patterns. So what are some uh, mutations that are recurrent across different uh, patients and, uh, and identify important genes um, that can go back to the lab and be studied in more detail. Um, so one uh, exceptional source of data that's been used to study this is the pan-cancer analysis of whole genomes. 
and there are other similar projects as well. So I'm going to go through some of the, the data that they um, put together. And what they did was sequence the whole genomes of um, almost 3,000 cancers and looked for these kind of patterns. Um, and what I'm showing here is uh, from this paper that was in Nature at the beginning of the year, where they characterized the most recurrent uh, cancer driver genes. So you can see the number of patients that had uh, a particular mutation here and the gene name and the types of mutations that they observed. So the most common uh, type, the most common gene that's mutated in cancers is this gene called TP53. So that's uh, present in uh, almost 50% of the tumors that they sequenced. And in some cancer types, that is nearly always mutated. Um, and this is a view here of the distribution in the individual cancer types. So you can see here, TP53 is present in uh, almost all the different cancer types. And so uh, many of the genes at the top of this list here. But there are also, sorry, there are also some genes that are specific to particular cancer tracts. Types. So this gene APC here is predominantly found in colorectal cancers. And uh, this gene VHL is predominantly mutated in kidney cancers. Um, okay, so, so here I'm showing a summary of uh, how these genomes are mutated in these um, 2,500 or so cancers. So each ring in this kind of complicated plot is a type of mutation and each column is an individual cancer. So going from um, the inside, this black ring is all kinds of mutations. Then we have uh, non-coding point mutations in the purple ring. So these are the, the simple, simplest type of mutations. So say T to A. Uh, then we have these rearrangements in the green uh, germline mutations, and then uh, copy number alterations. So these are parts of chromosomes or whole chromosomes lost or gained. So you can see most cancers have all of these types of mutations. So you can see that these human cancers are very heavily mutated in general. So what causes these mutations? So um, a lot of the time, these mutations happen by chance. So DNA replication is incredibly accurate, but it's not quite perfect. So a single base pair mutation might happen in one in uh, a billion or so bases. Um, and one thing that's also become apparent in recent years and has been known for quite some time from epidemiological data is that environmental exposures can accelerate the acquisition of mutations. So for example, if you're a smoker or exposed to lots of UV light, then your lungs and skin may accumulate more mutations. Uh, and this has been quite a hot topic in recent years to discover uh, what types of mutations can be attributed to specific carcinogens. So, this has brought along the concept of mutational signatures. So I'll briefly spend a few minutes talking about these mutational signatures. So these are signatures of the simplest type of uh, mutation, these uh, base pair changes. And what this plot here is showing is classifying the different types of mutations firstly into the six different mutation channels. So whether that's being a C to A uh, on the left hand side, blue color, all the way to a T to G on the right hand side. And additionally, within each of these groups, these mutations are classified based on what, what the base is either side of that um, change. So here we have a C to T mutation with um, an A and a G on the left and the right hand side of that uh, piece of the genome. So you can see this has a very particular and special kind of signature. So there are four 
very large bars here. So we have this C to T flanked by an A and G, or flanked by a C and G, a G and G, or a T and G. And what um, this large scale genomic research has uh, found is that aging is what is contributing to this um, signature. So as people age, people accumulate mutations with this signature. And then different types of carcinogens then have different signatures. So here I'm showing what smoking and UV light look like, and you can see they're very characteristic and different from each other. So smoking has an enrichment of these C to A mutations, whereas UV light has an enrichment of C to T, but in a different context. So the flanking bases are different to what we saw here for the aging signature. And here's a plot summarizing that data again from the pan cancer analysis of whole genomes project. And there's a lot going on in this plot, but I just wanted to highlight a few things. So here, the, on, across the x-axis, each point is a mutation. Uh, each point is a cancer, sorry, and the x-axis is the number of mutations in that cancer. So first of all, you can see that the skin cancers and the lung cancers have the most mutations. And what you also see on the left-hand side is what are the different signatures in this plot? So you can see in the two lung cancers, there's lots of blue, which um, fits with these being this smoking signature. Whereas the skin cancer has this large uh, amount of the red mutations, which fits with this being the, the C to T UV signature. So this kind of analysis has revealed lots of interesting um, patterns in terms of what causes different mutations. So one other area of a lot of interest in recent years is um, identifying mutations in normal tissue. So for a long time, people have concentrated on identifying um, mutations in cancer, but the question is, how do we get to that point? So to try and answer that question, uh, researchers have been investigating mutations present in normal tissue. Um, and what they found is that all cells in the human body seem to be mutated to some degree. And even more interestingly, some cancer drivers are present in what appears to be normal tissue. So this is an example from the esophagus. And in this study here, what they did was take a number of people uh, from very young people that were 20 to 23 years old, up to older people that were 72 to 75, and sequenced um, samples of their esophagus. And what you can see here is, um, across the x-axis is the, the different samples, and across the y is the number of mutations, and the number of mutations in these samples increases over time. So the, the older you are, the more mutations you have. And that's what's shown here in panel C. Um, and you can also see here the, the difference. So you can see there's lots of uh, mutations at high variant allele fraction. So this is the, the frequency of that mutation in that sample. So a high variant allele fraction means that many uh, cells contain that mutation in that particular sample. So not only do you get more mutations, but you get... Um, many more cells have that particular mutation in older individuals. And so this is kind of like a diagrammatic view of what a person's esophagus looks like um, in terms of its genetics. And so you have this patchwork of different clones, so different subpopulations of cells that have different mutations. And what's um, shown here at the bottom is uh, some canonical or well-known driver mutations uh, in these genes. And these are present throughout these people's esophagus. Um, so this is kind of a, a fascinating thing that these people have, have accumulated many, many mutations, but um, do not necessarily have a, have a tumor. 
So what does this mean if we kind of put it all together? So normal cells can acquire mutations which cause clonal expansions. Um, these expansions can accumulate even more mutations. So typical cancers have one to 10 driving mutations. And certain environmental exposures may accelerate this, which ultimately can lead to a malignant tumor. Um, and so this is a, a classic model of colorectal cancer going through this process. So on the left hand side, uh, this is a zoomed in view on a pathology slide, so a slice of a person's tissue. And this is on the left hand side, normal colon epithelium. And as uh, the cells in the epithelium accumulate these mutations in these different pathways, it progresses along this um, road to cancer until at the right hand side you get this kind of ugly disordered um, uh, cellular and tissue architecture. Okay, so that was uh, what I was going to talk about as uh, cancer as a genetic disease, but it really feeds into this, this next part, which is thinking about cancer as an evolutionary disease. So this is a, this is a well-known quote that uh, people like to use in biology. So they say, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And this is equally true in cancer biology as well. Um, and this is here a, a famous sketch of, from Charles Darwin, where he sketches out the, the tree of life. And as we can see, we can do something similar in uh, using cancer sequencing data too, which we'll get to. So why should we think about cancer as an evolutionary process? Um, so here in this cartoon, I'm showing a, a group of cells and they progressively get mutated um, over time. So each lightning bolt here is a mutation. So this blue cell here is mutated and it clonally expands and then ultimately covers the whole um, cell population. And then you might, may get a new mutation. So here the the cell turns red and that clonally expands. Uh, so why should this be thought of as an evolutionary process? So the reason for that is that it satisfies all the necessary and sufficient conditions for evolution. So we have variation in the population, so DNA mutations that we've already talked about. That variation is heritable, so daughter cells will um, inherit the um, genome mutations from their parent cells and these this variation can be selected so in this picture at the top these blue cells and red cells are selected they have higher fitness than the other cells and expand and take over the population and what's been shown in recent years is that cancers are very diverse populations so different regions of the same tumor are often genetically very different and one useful thing to think about, how to think about this is that cancers um, include many different clones. So a clone is a group of cells that share some ancestry. So in this picture of a, of a genetically diverse tumor on the left, um, we've got many different clones here. So how did people find this out in, in tumors? So, so Researchers took a, a similar approach and they sequenced different regions of the same tumor and constructed their evolutionary relationships. So here is an example from a renal cancer. So this is the, the image of the, the cancer that they studied here. And then they took um, different regions from this tumor and then sequenced each region and then compared them to look at differences in their genetics. And what they could do then is construct this phylogenetic tree. Uh, so what this shows is what mutations are shared between different re regions and what mutations are unique. So for example, this VHL mutation is present in all of these regions, whereas this set D2 splice site is unique to this region R4A while the set D2 frame shift is present in uh, some of the regions, but not all of them. So you can see here that 
this tumor is incredibly diverse and has lots of different mutations in different regions. And going back to Charles Darwin's famous sketch, you can see that this is a, a representation of this kind of idea, but, in, but using cancer genetics data. And almost all cancers that have been studied in this way exhibit some kind of intratumor heterogeneity. So why is this important and why is it a problem? So uh, some of the consequences of this is that certain clones within the cancer may be resistant to therapy. So perhaps this yellow clone here um, has some mutation that makes it resistant to a therapy. So when you treat the cancer with particular therapy, you will kill everything except for the yellow population of cells and that's then resistant to any therapy. You might also impact di diagnosis. So if you looked at these two different regions of the tumor and made um, treatment decisions based on that, you might, you might have different answers depending on where you sampled. And ultimately this can also help us better understand the disease. So going back to some of the, the research I showed earlier, if we think of these uh, driving mutations here from an evolutionary perspective, these mutations are going to be the ones that are highly selected. So give the, the tumor the highest fitness possible. What, meanwhile, um, going back to this idea of mutational signatures, smoking will accelerate um, the evolutionary process. So more mutations means there'll be a greater chance to acquire a driver. So that's ultimately why smoking um, increases the likelihood of, of individuals getting a tumor. Um, another thing we can do is start to think about better ways to prognosticate and uh, research tumors. So if we frame this in terms of evolution, prognosis is in, a, is in some ways determined by the future evolution of cancer cells. So if we can measure this evolution, can we predict patient outcomes? So one way to kind of solve this problem is can we measure the evolvability of cancer cells? So by evolvability, I mean some capacity of the tumor to evade therapy or progress to a more uh, malignant state. And we could think about trying to measure that in some way. So one way that we could get at this question is to try and think about an evolutionary biomarker. So uh, we might hypothesize that more diverse tumors have worse outcomes. Uh, so these more diverse ones, like on the right hand side, might harbor a bad subpopulation of cells. So if we compare these two uh, kind of cartoon tumors, on the left hand side, this tumor has very few clones. It has low genetic diversity. And this tumor is unlikely to contain a well-adapted clone. And we might think that this has a good outcome. Whereas on the right-hand side, this tumor has many clones, a higher gen genetic diversity, and uh, is likely to contain a well-adapted clone and may have poor outcome. So does this, does this, is this borne out in the data? So I'm going to show two examples of, of how this idea works in practice. So this, uh, plot here is called a, a Kaplan-Meier plot. And what's shown across the x-axis is time in months, and across the y is the, the probability of progression. And what this study was looking at is a disease called Barrett's esophagus, which is a pre-malignant legion for esophageal cancer. And it's a very hard to predict which people with Barrett's esophagus will go on to have cancer currently. But if you take this um, evolutionary approach and split these groups, uh, split these patients into those that have many clones and those that have few, then you can see you can start to predict which of these um, patients are likely to progress to cancer. So this green line is the top 25% of patients in terms of their number of clones. And these are much more likely to go on to have a cancer. The other example is from a lung cancer uh, cohort. And what's shown here is 
the percentage of the genome that has subclonal copy number alterations. So a subclonal copy number alteration is a copy number alteration, say a, a loss of a particular chromosome <coughs> um, that's in some but not all of the cancer cells. And you can see those patients that have a high percentage of subclonal copy number alterations uh, are more likely to, um, uh, to go on to die earlier than those that have a, a, low, uh, a low number of um, subclonal copy number alterations. Another way that cancer evolution is um, useful for thinking about um, uh, the problems associated with treatment is the immune system. So I'm sure in some of the talks that you'll hear in future that uh, immunotherapy will come up. So this is a, an important new class of treatment strategies. And so this relies on the immune system being able to recognize cancer cells and remove them. But what often happens is that cancers adapt to the immune system to avoid recognition. And so in this study here, they looked for loss of heterozygosity. So this is a, a loss of one of the copies of a particular important gene called HLA, which is involved in the machinery um, that enables uh, immune cells to recognize cancers. And so uh, what they found in this study was that tumors that had uh, that there was a high selective pressure for tumors to lose this um, HLA locus. Okay, so for the last few minutes of the talk, I'm going to talk about some of my own research at MSKCC with uh, Dr. Saurabh Shah and, and the lab, where we try and use um, new single cell approaches to investigate cancer evolution. So what's become apparent is that potentially almost all tu tumors are so diverse that every cancer cell may potentially be different. So single cell genomics can help us look at these differences. Um, and that's really important because most of the technologies used so far profile a big chunk of tissue and may miss some of the diversity that's present in single cells. So we really need single cell technology to be able to look at these differences. And what we can do now, uh, especially in, with some advances in recent years, is to sequence the DNA or RNA of thousands of cells in a single experiment. Um, so I'm not going to talk about RNA, but I will briefly mention some of the experiments we do on, on DNA. So this is an example of the DNA copy number in a single cell from a, a patient's tumor. So what this plot shows is the genome locations across the x-axis and the y-axis is the copy number. So the, the amount of DNA copies we have at that particular locus. And you can see there are regions of the genome that have been gained and also regions of the genome that have been lost. And these differences in gains and losses may potentially be different in different cells in the tumor. So using this single cell approach, we can really look into in great detail um, how these changes accumulate. And so this is an example of a high grade serious ovarian cancer where we've looked at thousands of cells from a patient sample. So this is a, is a kind of representation of these thousands of cells. So again, across the x-axis is the genome location, and each row this time is an individual cell. So there are thousands of cells in this picture. And as you can see, there are regions that are very different between different cells. Um, so for example, we can see here a region of cells that have a, a whole genome doubling. So this uh, going from this gray color to this darker orange color, represents a whole genome doubling. Um, we can also see that there are two groups of cells here that have lost a region of chromosome five. Um, and we can also see, look at individual genes. So one of the important genes in high-grade serous ovarian cancer is this gene called MYC. 
And in these different cell populations, there's quite different number copies of MYC. So at the bottom here, this group of cells that I've labeled clone R has the lowest number of copies at copy number around four. And it goes all the way up to uh, almost 15 copies in this whole genome doubling um, cell population. Okay, so that um, brings the end to my talk. Um, and I just wanted to highlight some of the kind of key messages that I hope you have found interesting and um, uh, kind of key to understanding cancer as an evolutionary and genetic disease. So first of all, cancers um, arise due to mutations that promote and control proliferation. So lots of the work has been trying to understand what these mutations are and in which genes they occur. And sequencing can really help us understand these patterns. And also evolutionary thinking is really required to make sense of these patterns and to think about new ways to combat resistance and understand the disease. Um, so lastly, I'd, I thought I'd spend just the, the last few minutes talking about what it's like being a, a cancer researcher um, and why I kind of chose this career. So I think it's worth bearing in mind that cancer research, uh, research requires kind of all kinds of skills. So I spend my day on the computer doing mathematics and statistics um, on this kind of data. And that's a really key skill that's becoming more important um, as time goes on, as cancer research accumulates huge, huge data sets. So those uh, uh, skills are really needed. Um, but there's also a huge amount of need for experimentalists and clinicians who really understand the, the clinical problems and are able to help scientists in those kind of areas. Um, yeah, one of the things that I really enjoy is being able to explore interesting and uh, fundamental questions about how a body does and doesn't work. Um, I think thinking about cancer as you know how how the cells um, get mutations and that causes dysfunction is kind of a really interesting um, way to think about things. And yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of interesting research topics. And um, I'm really happy that I'm able to con continue what I started and what the reason I started studying physics and apply kind of quantitative approaches to study like physical phenomena. Um, so with that, I'll end. And so thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. We greatly appreciate it. So we'll go ahead um, and start our Q&A. You can stop sharing your screen as well. And thank you. Great. So a couple of questions we have. Um, the first is from Anish Bachu. Why are only six types of mutations shown and not the other six? Like, why is C or G shown but not C, but not G greater than C? No. Uh, that's a good question. So that's because um, DNA is comes in base pairs. Uh, so you have a T. Um, so they come in base pairs, so they're always paired with their kind of neighbor. So a T to C will look the same as, uh, say, a, a G to A. So, uh, and we can't distinguish those things. So that's why um, when we look at those things, we only show the, the one possible thing that we can kind of know. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions regarding CRISPR. Um, this is from, some, from Pravilaki of Palwai. They ask, what, which types of mutations do CRISPR-Cas9 target? Germline or somatic or both? Um, so I'm not a CRISPR expert, but um, mm -hmm. there's lots of research going on with CRISPR for sure. And mm -hmm. um, so it I think it depends on what field. So for sure, people are interested in looking at ways to use CRISPR technology to stop um, inherited diseases. So that would mean that they need to alter the germline. But there's also research involved trying to figure out if we could alter somatic 
uh, cells. So I would say that there's both uh, research ongoing depending on the disease and what, what question you're asking. Okay, great, thank you. Andrew Mitchell asks, is cancer inevitable for people born with miscopy DNA? Um, no, so it's not inevitable. It just increases your chances. So um, okay. yeah, particular people that inherit a defective gene in one of these important genes will have a higher chance, but it, it's not certain that they'll get cancer because they still in all likelihood need to acquire additional mutations in their body afterwards. Okay, great. Um, an anonymous um, attendee asked, how big of a problem is secondhand smoking and the cause of set up cancer mutation? Um, I don't really know. So I think there must be evidence for it having an effect, which is why you know, smoking is not allowed in, um, in pubs and uh, you know, in so indoor spaces, and that must have mm -hmm. an effect for sure, but I don't know fully you know, oh. what, what the details are. Okay, great. Alina Matthew asks, is it very difficult to target mutations that affect only mitosis? Um, so targeting mutations is, in general, very challenging. Um, I don't know if mitosis is more challenging than other um, processes, um, but in general, it, there's a lot of work goes into finding t targets uh, for particular mutations, and it's a challenging problem. Mm -hmm. Salwa <clears throat> Almayouf asks, how can we tackle drug resistant and tumor heterogeneity from a pharmacogenetics point of view? Do we target one variant at a time? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So one of the things that people are thinking about now is how to better use multiple therapies at the same time. So can we use therapies in a kind of clever evolutionary informed way in some ways and target different um, different subpopulations of the cancer at the same time or sequentially. Um, and it's currently unknown what the best way to do that is, but it's ongoing research. Okay, great. And N Natalie Roberts asks, how are malignant and benign tumors differentiated? Um, so there's a kind of pathology um, answer to that question, which is mm -hmm. that a malignant uh, tumor is one that kind of escapes the basement membrane in an epithelial cancer, for example. So it can invade the surrounding tissue, whereas a benign uh, tumor will stay within its surroundings. Okay, great. Um, and we've found a couple of questions about like your professional background and training. So could you further elaborate on computer computing skills needed for cancer research, perhaps like recommending a book that would be helpful or any resources that you've used in your work? Sure. Um, so what do I, so in my day to day, I use a lot of the R statistical programming language. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a good way to start. And there's lots of resources online uh, to look, to look at for that. Um, other people in the, in the group use Python more, and that's also a good option. Um, mm. So yeah, I'd say they're the two main programming languages that people know. I think another thing that you need is um, some good grasp of statistics um, and you know how to answer uh, questions from a statistical point of view. Um, so that, yeah, those are the things that I would think about. Okay, great. Um, we actually have a COVID-19 related question um, from an anonymous attendee. How has COVID-19 impacted the way you've conducted your research? Uh, so I'm really fortunate that I just work on a computer all the time. So mm -hmm. I can work from anywhere. And actually right now I'm in London um, and not in New York. So I kind of... Yeah escaped to be closer to my family just before COVID hit. So I'm in very fortunate that I can do that, but it's definitely more challenging for people who conduct their research in the lab. Um, so for me, it hasn't changed so much. Okay, great. Thank you for joining. I know there's quite a time difference, so we appreciate it. <laughs>
Okay, great. Um, Numa Qureshi asks, so mutator genes, proto-oncal genes, and the others, um, do they help reduce mutations that lead to cancer? Uh, so mutator genes would likely increase the chance that you get mutations leading to cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and the other types of genes probably have no effect on the number of mutations you get. Okay, great. And another um, attendee asks, um, Karen Ibrahimi, do more diverse tumors make them generally harder to treat? Can someone have more than one type of cancer? Uh, so from the few studies that I talked about in other studies, it does look like the more diverse tumors are harder to treat. Um, why exactly that is, I think it's probably still a bit unknown and people are thinking mm -hmm. about that. Um, mm -hmm. What was the second bit of the question? Are more diverse tumors harder to treat? Are the, are the tumors harder to treat when they're diverse? Uh, I think, yeah, th they probably are, but yeah, we still don't know why for sure. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. And another anonymous um, question is, in the plot that shows the accum accumulations of mutations in the normal esophagus, the, the plot that was stratified by age, um, what was used as the benchmark to assess the presence or absence of mutations in sample tissues? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So I, I think in that study, they probably had um, a sample of the patient's blood so they could compare the difference between mutations found in the esophagus and make sure they weren't also found in the blood. Okay, great. Um, and another question from an anonymous attendee, could you give a specific example of how you use statistical analyses in your research of single cells? Um, so one thing that we're trying to do at the moment is develop ways to do phylogenetics of single cells. So in one of the examples I showed, I showed an example where there was maybe uh, six or seven samples. And in that study, they made a phylogenetic trio. So that sample, but we have, sorry, we have, uh, <laughs> thousands of cells in our single cell sequencing data set. So we have to use quite advanced statistical methods then to enable us to infer these phylogenetic trees with such big um, data set sizes. Okay, great. And the last question um, is from Emma Wu. She asks, do you think cancer is evolving efficiently? Uh, do I think cancer is evolving efficiently? So, um, there's a few different ways to answer that question. So first of all, cancer is kind of an inevitable process for multicellular organisms in some ways. So all kind of animals and even some plants get some form of cancer. So it seems like it's very hard for evolution in general to get to stop people getting cancer. Um, mm -hmm. And Second, the, there are some rare occurrences of transmissible cancers that get passed on between animals. So one example is the Tasmanian devil. Uh, so there's a, there's a kind of a face cancer that's passed on between Tasmanian devils. So that's a, a case where uh, evolution is kind of ongoing for a particular cancer, and that's been going for you know, tens of years. Great. Thank you so much again, um, Dr. Williams, for such an informative talk. Um, before we close, I would like to share some reminders. Um, firstly, for those um, that do have questions for Dr. Williams, we will be sending a follow-up email to everyone where you can submit your questions via the Google Doc, and Dr. Williams will answer them on the Google Doc and um, Twitter as well. And I'll go ahead and share my screen to share our next lecture, which will be on the 23rd. And it will be with Dr. Caitlin Stewart as well. And the other lecture, um, lecture we'd like to announce is today at 5.30, we have Dr. Thompson. He will be offering a talk to all students. Um, at 5.30 p.m., we will be sending you the link to register as well for that. Um, all are welcome 
to join. Dr. Thompson is um, our president and CEO here at MSK. Um, and this is a great opportunity to learn um, from our senior leaders on what our institution is doing. And again, thank you all for attending. We look forward to seeing you this Thursday at 2 p.m. Thank you all and 